Well, good morning, KCP family and everybody joining us online for worship this morning. Even though I really wish that we could all be together this morning, I trust that you and your family are still able to gather together and to give some attention and time to the coming of the Son of God at Christmas as we enter into our fourth Sunday of Advent. And this morning, we're actually looking at our third Christmas carol in the series uh, together as we lead up to Christmas. And this morning, we're looking at O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, which is a, a famous hymn that actually has its origins all the way back in the 8th and 9th century monasteries. So it's a really old hymn, but its lyrics, the version that we sing today, uh, were made popular by John Mason Neal in 1851. And the lyrics of this hymn, they point to a desperate condition and a failed mission of God's people. It's the picture of God's people meant to bring light and hope into the world. And that they've now found themselves in a place of total darkness, longing for the Messiah to come. It's also the condition of God's people in Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9 is this passage that's very familiar and often quoted at Christmas because it points to some of the deepest needs. It puts its finger on some of the places in our hearts that we have the deepest longings and also the unexpected gifts that God brings to us at Christmas and how he intends to deliver those gifts to his people. So what I invite you to grab your Bible and open up to Isaiah chapter 9, and we're going to read through verses 1 through 7, and let's take a little bit of time to talk about these great gifts that God brings to us in the person of Jesus at Christmas. Isaiah chapter 9, nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Amen. Well, every Christmas, the dilemma of grandparents is, do they get their grandchildren what the parents want them to get? Or do they get the grandkids what the, the grandkids really want? Do they go rogue? And of course, we all know the difference between gifts, getting gifts that we really want and then getting gifts that eh, we really need. And the faces of small children on Christmas morning show us that it's often a great divide between those things. But I think that there's two places where what we really want and what we really need converge. The first place is when our hope is on the eternal, when we have a firm grasp of the eternal and we start to see things the way that God sees things. The other time when those things converge is when we find our pla ourselves in places of desperation. And so I want to start this morning by giving you an illustration, a little story to help us enter into the moment in time that Isaiah is speaking into here in 740 BC. What was it like when Isaiah wrote chapter 9? So four years after the death of his wife, there was a very experienced caver named Gary Lutz who took his boys, who were 13 and 9 years of age, to the Smoke Hole Campgrounds in Franklin, West Virginia. With 20 years of experience, Gary took his boys into the New Trout Cave, where he had a lot of time and experience looking through this cave. But this was a chance for he and his boys to have 
some desperately needed fun and adventure after the passing of their mother. Everything was fine until 45 minutes into the cave where Gary made a decision to trust himself instead of the 20 years of experience and training that he had. You see, he took off his backpack, which had extra light, extra blankets, medicine, food, and water. And the three of them proceeded with just their hard hats and carbide lights 200 feet deeper into the cave. Just 10 minutes later, 13-year-old Tim's light inexplicably dimmed and went out. Suddenly, Gary uh, thought, we've got to get back to the, to the backpack. So they turned, they started to go back. But two to three minutes later, nine-year-old Buddy's light went out as well. Suddenly, Gary panicked. He thought to himself, this cannot happen. 20 minutes later, searching for the, the backpack, Gary's light went out as well. And suddenly, the three froze, holding each other in complete darkness. It was as though they were totally blind. Some of us have really never even experienced that level of darkness before. Absolutely no light. And so they settled into this place of panic and terror. There were tears. There was hunger. There was even hallucinations. They could hear the bats around them, scoping them out and screeching, trying to figure out who they were. And they descended into total darkness for day after day after day all because of a series of foolish choices that they had made. And now they were literally in a place where there was no way out. Lost, alone, consumed with darkness. So welcome to Isaiah chapter 9. Now in Isaiah 9, the people of God are obviously not in a place of physical darkness, but it's a place of spiritual and moral, social and relational and cultural darkness brought about by a series of choices that they had made, starting with their king Ahaz. Now what we need to know about the king at that point in time is that the way people thought about the king was sort of this strange combination of, say, the president of the United States and Billy Graham. It's like a, a, a leadership fusion of political and spiritual leadership brought together in the, in the people of Israel. And so this position of king and the church complicit with them had shut the doors to the temple and they had put idolatrous worship sites on every corner. And Ahaz went so far as to sacrifice his own son to a false god. This was the Old Testament church. Now what in the world would God say to the church in this situation? Here's what he says. He says, my church, my beloved, I'm going to give you the gift of Christmas. And into the darkness that you have chosen, I promise my son. And so what I want to do this morning as we look into this passage is ask the question, Father, what would you do for us when we choose the darkness as well? So would you pray with me for just a minute as we ask his spirit to guide us? Father, we pray that you would protect us this morning from being hasty and help us as your people to be faithful as we look at this passage and try to understand the gifts that you've given and when we need them most through your son and through your zeal. God, whether we know you or not this morning, we pray for your help in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, if you ever find yourself stuck in a cave and without any kind of light, the mission of high adventure and cave exploration suddenly changes. It's now about survival. And so when the spiritual condition of Israel became that of deep darkness, they began to lose their sense of mission as well. And so what I mean by that is that in Genesis 12, 3, we see that we have been called to be a people through which all of the earth would be blessed, that we would be a light to the nations. And yet when we failed to that and we've gone into darkness ourselves, God has said to us, he will bring his, his son to be the light that would heal us instead and renew our condition. And so that puts a probing question before us this morning from actually Isaiah chapter 8, which we haven't had time to read. But in verses 18, we read this. God will be a sanctuary, a holy place. But for Israel and Judah, he will be a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And for the people of Jerusalem, he will be a trap and a snare, and many will stumble upon him. 
And so I think that Isaiah is asking us a probing question this morning, even as the church today. Is Jesus for you that which stabilizes your life? Is he that which brings you security? Or do you stumble and fall? Does his will, his lordship, the way of his love and his humility, is that a firm foundation for you or do you tend to trip all over it? Is Jesus sanctuary for you or is he a snare? And I think that the reason that that question is so important for us, not just about our spiritual condition but about our mission, is because if we stumble, the world around us will fall as well, flat on their face. And if we go dark as the church, what happens to the world around us? And so yet, even though this last crazy year has maybe tempted us to fall all over ourselves, maybe even tempted us to go dark as a church and as a people, the love of God in this passage is telling us, I have gifts for you, my beloved. And here's the first one, gospel hope. So if you look at verse 1, look at what it says, nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the, way, and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. Now, if you were to look at a map, you would see that the land of Naphtali and Zebulun are right near the Sea of Galilee, which is in the northernmost part of Israel. And that was the way that Assyria to the north would come down and begin their route. Whenever they attacked, the first people hit. Guess who took the brunt of the attack? Guess who was roughed up first every single time? It was Zebulun and Naphtali. And that goes in where you begin, circumstance begins to create an outlook like on life that settles in where you begin to say, really, Lord? Why me again? Why does this stuff keep happening to me? If it can go bad, it most certainly will. We're Zebulun, we're Naphtali. And yet notice what the Lord is saying here. He's speaking about a future event where he will honor those who have been thoroughly humbled. He says, you, though you were the first place that Assyria hit Galilee, one day I will honor you, I will exalt you to the highest place. I promise it. And notice the certainty to which God talks about all this that in talking about a future event, he uses the past tense as though it's already happened. He says in verse 2, those who walked in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Here's what God is saying. He's saying, yes, I have brought about circumstances into your uh, church to humble you as a church that would stop making the world even more dark. But now I'm restarting you with my son, and the new realities that will come through him are so certain that we can talk about them as though they've already happened, even though they hadn't for another 750 years. Listen, here's how the Bible defines hope. It's not how we talk about hope. We say, oh, I wish, I hope that it would happen. But when the Bible talks about hope, it talks about it as though something that God has promised will happen. It's a fixed certainty. And so then our disposition is to become that whenever we're faced with the darkness, we say, I can hang in there no matter what because he never lies. And so this deep hope begins to reframe everything, that the darkness in my life will never have the last word. Well, secondly, we get the hope of joy. We see that in verse 3 where God says that you have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. The, the you there is God. God has enlarged the nation, increased the Old Testament church's joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. Here's what God is saying, that there's a joy that happens when he increases our influence. He extends our borders. He's saying, I will bring about a growth in and through you that, frankly, you were totally resistant to, that, that you wanted no part about, of, and I will make light shine through you. We will reach the Gentiles. Your influence will spread beyond you to every tribe and tongue and nation. And it will bring about singing and dancing and festival joy because mission accomplished. Think about a farmer after a great crop. The fields are plentiful. The harvest has come in. The laughter 
is deep. The meals are sweet. The rest is wonderful. Or think about the way a soldier rejoices when the war is completely over. The wounds are healed. The victory is won. Let me ask you, what will your joy be like when the final victory has been won? See, we're to live our lives in such a way that we are characterized by the fixed certainty of the victory that's been won for us in the coming of Christ. Makes me think of that picture from April 14th, 1945. Maybe you've seen it. When a Navy corpsman named George Mendonza found out that World War II had come to an official end. And he was walking through Times Square in New York. And in this moment of spontaneity and, and jubilation, he found this woman that he didn't even know. Her name was Greta Zimmer. And he bent her back and he kissed her. And someone snapped their picture in that moment. And that picture became synonymous with the end of World War II. It's God saying, I will bring you that kind of joy that takes you to exuberant exhilaration. It's not the kind of joy where you simply survived and escaped the treachery of this world, but a deep confidence knowing that everything that's wrong will be made right and new again in Christ. Well, thirdly, we get the hope of freedom in verse 4. It says, for as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered. Notice it's still past tense, although speaking about a future event. He's talking about something coming in the future. You have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Now, what is Isaiah referring to there? Well, he's referring to Gideon's battle, where Gideon in Judges chapter 6 through 9 had to go fight against Midian. And Midian's forces, it said, were as vast as the locust. Couldn't even count them. Spread out over all the land. And, and Gideon had 32,000 soldiers to take with him. But God reduces his army down to 300 to say that when we win this victory, I want you to know, Gideon, you had no part of it. That the only reason we won was because of God. And these things that bring oppression and exile, yokes and bars and rods, these things that were typically used to drive animals, they were suddenly being used on the people of God to take them into exile. But here God says, know this, that one day you will be completely free of every bar and every yoke and every rod. And when that day comes, it will be absolutely clear that you had nothing to do with it. That the only way it happened, just like in Midian, was because of the power of God. And so when I come with gospel hope, you get the hope of joy and you get the hope of freedom. Now here's the truth. You may not think of yourselves right now as enslaved or bound up or locked up or captive in any way to money or sex or power, but we know better. We all, we all know the truth and we know that many of us are bound to having control and we're bound to the past, we're bound to worry over the future. We act like we're free, but God knows. And his promise to us is that when he comes, when the advent light comes, he will bring hope and joy and freedom. And lastly, the hope of peace. Verse 5, every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. This is an image of what happened after hours and hours, after days and days of hand-to-hand -hand combat on the field, where there's, it's literally body after body and the elements of war spread out over the field, people would come and scoop up the blood-soaked garments, rip the sandals off of the feet. They would throw them into the fire because there wasn't going to be any more war. It was totally over. And here's what God is saying. When I come... There will be a peace that nothing, nowhere, at any time can ever take away. Paul references this for us in Romans 8, 28 through 29, telling us as believers that we already have a foretaste of this peace. That the peace between us and God is so thorough and so finished that now the life of the believer, nothing can happen in the life of a believer except that which works for God's glory and your good in making you become more and more into the image of Jesus. That's how much peace has already begun. 
that the trajectory of every life situation now is bent in one direction towards his glory and our ultimate shalom, the putting of our lives back together in the image of Christ. And that what that means is that anywhere in life where there's brokenness or pain or injustice or evil or abuse, that that darkness never has the last word again. Yes, it may shout loudly right in our faces, but the promises and the imagery here in this passage and the seal of it all coming to us in the person of Jesus is God saying through Isaiah, I will have the last word. And those flashes of joy and freedom and peace that seem so elusive, one day they will be your permanent reality. And so these are the gifts of God to his people who've gotten trapped in the darkness. They are gifts that are meant to heal our condition and to recalibrate us for mission. I think about Susan and Lucy and Peter and the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe when they meet Father Christmas for the first time. Father Christmas comes on a sleigh. He's got a big bag of gifts. And as he gives the gifts to the children, he says that these are not toys, but they are tools that will bring healing and hope for the mission, a horn, a healing cordial, a shield, a bow, a sword. This is what God has outfitted us with at Christmas. Hope, joy, freedom, and peace. Do you have those as you enter into this week of Christmas? Are you experiencing those this morning? Well, I want to close by reminding us how God gives us these gifts so that we can receive them again and again and again because we need to. First, God gives us these gifts in the humblest of ways. He gives them to us in a child, a baby, his son Jesus. For unto us a child is born. To us a son is given. Where will the hope come from when we are in the places of the deepest darkness? God says, be on the lookout for an infant. It's like he's saying that you've had a millennia to use your own counsel and your own might. And where has that gotten you? It's gotten you lost in a cave. And so we're going to do this my way now. And my way is meant to remind you of your absolute weakness and dependency on my strength. That the rescue would come through a baby. And yet this son will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. You know, these words mean so much. We could probably have a sermon about each title. But at least they mean this, that you haven't done so very well with your own counsel, have you? But here comes my wonderful counselor. Look at your human strength. It's not cutting it. Look at your families, your lives, your marriages, the culture around you. You need my might. Look at your families. Look at... Look at your relationships. We long for a loving father. God says, I will be your everlasting father. Think about your businesses, your homes, the peace that escapes your heart. God says, I will bring that. I will do what you cannot do. And then he promises this, of the increase of his government and of my peace, there will be no end. I know it may come way slower than you want. And it may may not be as observable as you like. But these promises are more predictable than your next breath. For the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. You see, it's not about our zeal and our passion. God is saying, what you are not, I am. And the root of that word zeal means to come with red-faced intensity. What a depiction of God. That he would be that that determined and intense about our salvation the advance of his mission, the glory of his son, and the transformation of the world, that he would say, I am committed with red-faced earnestness. This is the gospel to us at Christmas. We've lost it all. God did it all. And because of the person of Jesus, we get it all back. And so the question is, will Christ be your sanctuary or your snare? Will he be your firm foundation or your stumbling block? The truth is that it's easy to proclaim at Christmas, he is my wonderful counselor, my mighty God, my everlasting father and prince of peace, until he asks you in some way to reduce your army from 32,000 to 300. 
And even though Gideon probably felt really vulnerable and exposed when that happened, if he would have just said, no thanks, Lord, I'll keep my 32,000, he might as well have walked right into a cave and ditched his only lantern. And that's what happens for us every time God puts his finger on a place where we need to trust and depend on his might and his counsel. Could be your finances, could be your relationships, could be your schedule. And when he does, lean into him to look vulnerable. But this is our calling at Christmas, to lean into him, to look into the light of Christ as firm foundation and sanctuary, even when it's scary and even when it hurts. Close with the story of Gary and his boys. They were in that cave for five days. And on the fifth day of total darkness, Gary was actually preparing his boys for death. He said, if I die, I want you to take my garments, my my jacket, and wrap it around you. And then he began to recite, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. And as his senses were blurring, he doubted them, but suddenly he began to see a light and he heard voices because 50 people had begun searching for them for 48 hours. And this is what Gary said, it was a blinding light. That blinding light like that, having been in the darkness for five days, literally hurts. But he said, I couldn't stop staring at it. With all the pain it caused, he stared right into the light. And this is what Isaiah 9 is telling us to do. That with all the darkness that we've been in, we are being called to stare right into the light of Jesus. The second thing that Gary said was, caves seem to have this musty and damp odor. You can actually smell the rock. And yet when I came out of the cave, I was hit with this hot and humid air And suddenly I got the smell of trees and leaves and flowers, and I breathed it all in. So many odors all of a sudden, and they were exhilarating. This week, brothers and sisters, this last week before Christmas, take a deep breath of the gospel of grace for you in the person of Jesus. We want you to slow down this week. We want you to get alone with the presence and promises of God and to breathe in the fragrance of hope and joy, of freedom and peace that are yours in Christ and one day will come to us in a way that will never end and never be taken away. Well, let's pray together and then let's sing, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, as we prepare our hearts for this final week of Christmas. Father, we're asking that we would be able to stare right into the wonder of what you've done. Thank you for promising the hope that in the face of our worst choices, that you come and bring rescue. We cannot do this without you. It is so easy for us to depend on our own strength, our own might, and our own counsel. But you are wonderful counselor. You are Prince of Peace. You are mighty God, everlasting Father, And so meet with us this morning, and may our prayer be, O come, O come, Emmanuel, again, and ransom our hearts wherever we're captured. In Jesus' name, amen.